9-11 attacks temporarily wiped out a lot of communication systems. That's when ham radio operators went to work. Andrea Day reports. When the towers went down, so did almost all forms of communication. That's when the ham radio operators sprang into action. Once the towers collapsed and everything went black in here, uh, people were just dumbfounded. Everybody's trying to talk at once, and people pick up their cell phones and couldn't get through. It was a day guys like Charlie Hargrove and Mark Phillips train for. They communicate on amateur radios, and when disaster strikes, they get messages through when no one else can. When it finally happens, you just go into automatic. You don't even think about it. The city was virtually paralyzed, and ham radios were about the only way to talk. So Charlie, Mark, and some 250 volunteers spread out, backing up the city systems 24 hours a day. Down at uh, ground zero. They got word to frantic relatives, worked at shelters, even pulled people off the streets. But they're the ones you don't see or read about. I wouldn't say that we were heroes. Uh, we're doing our job. Just being out there, the sense of being part of the community and, and just helping out. If I've got the ability and I've got the time, why not? And that's a true hero. Andrea Day, Fox 5 News. When hurricanes or other natural disasters strike, getting information to the public isn't always easy. That's where ham radio operators often become a vital link to survival. Gloria Lopez joins us from our newsroom with more on that. Gloria? Gerald, at a time when cell phone communication is virtually impossible and phone lines are down, we sat down with an amateur radio operator, also known as a ham radio operator, who is able to hear transmissions from the affected areas. Looking for stations in the uh, affected area from Hurricane Katrina. So they're still collecting information as it's uh, winding down. When all else fails, this is the system that doesn't. We like to say that ham radio is unstoppable. Even when communication to the affected areas is impossible, ham Good radio evening. operators like Gary Pierce make the impossible happen. Your signal's a little bit weak, so let me turn the volume up and uh, catch you one more time. I think from his home, Pierce can hear transmissions from ham operators in the hurricane-torn areas, passing vital information. Uh, ham will report in uh, every hour or so with conditions as they are uh, occurring uh, where she is. Over. In times of emergency, they can be a lifeline, easy to use, simple to set up. What we do is take an antenna like this. I'll use a slingshot and then pull the wire back up with it. And just like that, the world it's about 25 miles west of Pensacola is at his fingertips. And provide that link of communications in, in just minutes of setup time. Uh, we're looking for weather data measured or observed weather data or storm damage reports. Your call size, please. In the coming days, transmissions like that one will be a vital link and in some cases, the only one. It's just, to me, it is magic. Okay, I'm going to wet my whistle. Gary tells us that most ham operators operate right out of their homes, but that many neighborhoods don't allow those antennas, and he thinks that's a shame, only because that's what operators need to pick up those signals from the affected areas. Gerald? All right, Gloria Lopez reporting from our newsroom. Thanks. In the storm and all the cell phone batteries have died. There's still one way to communicate, and that's ham radio. Uh, Tampa Bay hams are amateur radio operators. They're demonstrating for the public this weekend. Mike Fletcher, uh, one of those ham operators, you're in the studio with us this morning. Thanks very much for joining us on this uh, week of uh, remembrance uh, for what you guys do. And this is a very important uh, sort of uh, uh, how, you, how you provide this. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, we, uh, we actually are operating a, an annual contest or event, which uh, we call Field Day. Mm -hmm. And this is an event where different clubs and organizations around the country all set up as a simulated emergency situation. So we try to operate with standby power generators, batteries, what have you, and in conditions that aren't our normal operation. So we set up in tents, trailers, what have you and try to contact as many people as we can across the country and that helps us test our emergency preparedness and our ability to to actually set up and deploy to an event should we need to and this really is that old school technology that will be working when all of our newfangled stuff and the grid goes down well but the ham radio primarily does not use infrastructure a ham radio is simply a radio that you turn on and operate and you set up an antenna, it can be a wire thrown through the trees or what have you, and you can communicate to other people. So it doesn't depend on the cell towers, the satellites. Mm -hmm. so we have other technology that we use, we have infrastructure that we use. There are actually ham radio satellites, there's ham radio on the International Space Station. 
but uh, this is so we can set up and operate without using that infrastructure and be able to communicate when everything else is down. And really it is, as we head into this storm season, uh, the emergency needs for this are really what you guys, that's the backbone of why you're around. That's true. Uh, that, that's what this exercise is about, so we can practice our skills and learn how to do those things and, and be prepared. We also brought another piece of equipment out here. Talk to us about this big light. This is something that's uh, needed as well. Well, you know, in an emergency, one of the things that you lose quite regularly is power. And without power, of course, you can't see. So being able to operate day and night, you need to have a light so you can tell what's going on. You've got the portable ham radio set up. You've got right. the base station here. And all of this is going on this weekend. You're trying to talk to folks around the world. That's right. Our operation is set up. Uh, our, our operation is at 7801 North 22nd Street at the Tampa Amateur Radio Club uh, headquarters. And everybody's welcome to come by and ham radio is pretty easy to get into now so uh, come by and see us and you can get on the air we'll put you on the air and try it out all right and you can talk to folks all across the world across the country mike thanks very much for stopping thanks by for appreciate us. your service for us and if you need any more information you can head on over to abc action News. amateur com. radio operators can communicate with people all over the country and even the world this weekend they're testing to see just how far their signals can go as Tuner's reporter Will Dupree shows us, this exercise could help the next time a disaster strikes. When some people hear this, they might mistake it for just clicks and beeps. But to Lloyd Beeson, these sounds make up a message he can send just about anywhere. We'll probably work everything from Maine to California, even to Hawaii. Beeson can communicate using Morse code. And the more contacts he makes this weekend, the better for him and his friends. I think my antenna shifted just a little bit. Who are amateur radio operators. We have a motto, when all else fails, amateur radio. This weekend, Paul Bisdorf and other ham radio operators are competing in a national field day. The object of the exercise is to set up stations and make contacts uh, all around the country and sometimes all around the world to demonstrate and to exercise our capabilities to set up emergency communications. Yes, they are competing to make as many contacts as possible. But they say the practice will also help in the event of an emergency or disaster. If we lose telephone communications and we need to talk to Oklahoma City for aid, um, the Oklahoma City will have an emergency operations center, we will have one here, and we can talk to them by radio. So the next time something bad happens, the ham radio operators say they still have a way to call for help. It's actually a pretty cool deal. From Broken Arrow, Will Dupree, Tune News Works for you. Will, thank you very much. Good stuff there. Now, the Tulsa Ham Radio Group is always looking for new members. If you're interested in joining, we'll post some helpful information on our website, KJRH.com. Flashback time and old technology gaining a whole new following. We're talking about ham radio. The number of licenses at an all-time high and the renewed interest is coming from more than just hobbyists. Jonathan Sari is on the radio with us live from Atlanta. Jonathan. Hi, John. Emergency managers are increasingly turning to ham radio for backup communications during a crisis. Blizzards, hurricanes, tornadoes, natural disasters wreak havoc on modern communications networks. So more and more people are turning to an old solution. Whiskey One Alpha Whiskey. Ham radio. But it is interesting that some of the technology that's been around for 80, 90, 100 years is still relevant. Amateur radio enthusiast John Davis says major disasters such as 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina underscored the need for communications not dependent on landlines or cell towers. It's just another avenue, another opportunity for us to be able to communicate, uh, especially during in a crisis. Emory Healthcare is among a growing number of hospital systems and emergency management agencies developing an amateur radio presence. Ham operators have a permanent station inside the Georgia Emergency Management Agency's operations center. We look at ham radio operators just like GEMA staff, just like DOT staff or Georgia State Patrol staff. They're a critical partner with us. W4IGE. The specially trained volunteers provided critical communications during this winter's ice storms that gridlocked Metro Atlanta. Ham radio will never die. And the quickest means of communication is Morse code. It'll get out when none of this will.
So, John, in an era of emails and smartphones, the number of ham radio licenses in this country is at an all-time high, more than 720,000. Back to you. Yeah, I think it was on Jay Leno. They once had a bunch of kids texting against guys doing Morse code, and the Morse and code, Morse code won. They were faster. Great stuff. Jonathan Sarri. Radios have Thanks. been around for more than a century, and they have proven to be very reliable. Even during the severe weather the eastern U.S. experienced this week, New Channel 5's Dan Corcoran now with more on the efforts to keep those essential lines of communication open. Well, ham radios have been around since the early 1900s. They are still used today, and they were buzzing this week with the approach and landfall of what was Hurricane Irene. And we appreciate your assistance. In the United States, 2,203 are on right now. Are on right now. Thousands of ham radio operators are active at any given time. There are more than a half million FCC licensed operators in the U.S. Many of them this week were listening, even helping, as Irene moved past Florida and up the East Coast. We go basically what's called off the grid and we basically communicate amongst each other. Mark Phila of Palm Beach County is part of an often unrecognized network of licensed ham radio operators who can transmit important messages word for word when a natural disaster knocks the masses and emergency services into the dark. To talk to their state EOCs, between municipalities and even to hospitals and other non-government organizations. And towers like these have been built to withstand extremely strong winds. But if power should get knocked out, that is when a ham radio operator will jump into action. The Carolinas all the way up into Connecticut, uh, all different areas of uh, instances of trees down, power lines, power outages. Ham radio signals remain intact even when cellular, landline phones and internet connections are interrupted. Messages from emergency officials can be passed along from one amateur radio op to another. This is the antenna that allows you to talk around the world. A 20-year hobby for Phila that he says can often turn into the sole line of communication during a battering storm like Irene. And most licensed ham radio operators in the U.S. use their own antennas and their own radios backup powered by either batteries or generators so they can stay up and running when now, other communications... completely separate from... Um, uh, this is just a great hobby. Uh, and uh, this is also for a great, um, a great way to communicate with people. Um, for instance, on September 11th. September 11th, if you were in New York City... You're not getting a phone call out. Um, and I know people who are in the military who communicated with uh, spouses around the world. Uh, they could even c contact somebody and say, would you call this number and tell them that I'm okay? Um, it's, it's ham radio. This is same technology that was used World War II, same kind of shortwave ham radio. Is that the same thing, shortwave ham radio? Uh, similar, yeah. Similar. It's, it's, a, it's a long range. It's, it's basically saying high frequency is what we use to talk around the world. And okay. we'll, we'll talk to, to that in a few minutes as far as the, the technology. Okay. So. Tell me, um, where would you even start? If you wanted to have, you wanted to be able to communicate with people, you wanted to be able to have a network um, and, and talk to people and, and you know, Inform them on what's happening in case of a disaster. What would you do? Well, let, you, let's start first. We'll answer the young gentleman's question, what is amateur radio? Okay. You want to start there? Sure. So amateur radio is, is a form of communication. It's really, you know, amateur radio operators are a group of uh, folks that literally just talk to each other. Right. Uh, there's about 2.5 million in the world, 700,000 in the United States. Um, it is a licensed radio service. So I agree, you know, when you talk about a hobby, but... It's more than a hobby. It no, is you, a, it, you know it, what yeah. I mean. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. I just want yeah, to yeah, clarify. Yeah. Yeah. Is a federally uh, licensed, a, is a recognized radio service. You know, they talk about the old technology, and, and uh, I think I've even seen a low-tech technology. Th this is really no different than what police officers and firefighters, the same type of radios. It's just different. It's a different set of frequencies that we're using. Um, we actually, in some instances, you could say are very high tech. We do digital, which is what this radio is, and we'll do a demonstration a little bit later, and we'll be using the digital technology. Um, this this technology or this me method of communications is no different than what our public service and firefighters are using. Okay. 
So to go back and answer your question, how difficult it is, it's really not that difficult. There is an examination that you have to take. Um, Years ago, I took, because when I was in radio, I had to learn how to work, work the transmitter, and mm -hmm. you know, now I could just go on the radio. But when I first got in, I had to have what, a first, second, or third uh, class license. Is mm -hmm. it the same kind of test for the... Yeah, so there's a technician level, which is your entry level. Um, it gives you, um, and this is all of the frequencies. I'm not sure where to hold this so you yeah, can see it, right but all the frequencies. And so your technician level is basically um, your line of sight, what we call VHF, UHF, mm -hmm. very high frequency, ultra high frequency. That's your line of sight local stuff, you know, 30 to 80 miles, depending on your radio and your situation and are you on a hill or down on a hole kind of thing. Um, and, and then a little bit of what we call HF, which is high frequency, where it bounces off the ionosphere so we can talk to Japan. Um, they're a little small part of that with the technician. Then you get into the general, where you get more of the HF. And then you can get into what we call extra class, where you get everything on this page. Okay. How difficult is it to get that license? To get the last one? Yeah. Um, it's pretty technical. Uh, I've, I haven't got to spend near the time that I need to spend on it, but what time I have spent, I, I, I still need a lot, of, a lot of work for that. Wow. But it's really not everything we do when you're talking about this stuff. And, and I certainly want to talk about uh, uh, September 11th from that aspect and how big of a situation it was, not just for phones, but for the firefighters and the police and, and folks. But um, when, uh, when we do this kind of stuff, we stay more in that general range. So you're really talking two classes. You're talking your technician license and then your general class. The, the thing about it is, is it's a, a pool, and I forgot to grab my textbook but, that I was going to show you, but uh, there's a question pool. It's, for a technician, it's roughly 200, 250, 250 questions. They're all there. You can read every single question on the 35-question test. The general is the same way. What a ridiculous test. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so on September 11th, did you, were you fielding anything? No, actually in September, at that time, in September 11th, I actually wasn't even in ham radio yet. Okay. Why'd um, you get into it? Actually, my father-in-law, um, KD5QFB, that's our call sign, we'll talk a little bit about that, um, he got me into it. Uh, I've been in, uh, I actually started out in EMS and public services where I started out and I spent 10 years. I've been, I'm still licensed. I've been in uh, EMS for 20 years. I'm actually in, in the safety uh, professional field now. But, uh, uh, he got me into it. I, I took right to it. I love it. It's a, it's a passion of mine. I've, I've liked the preparedness. Mm -hmm. I've always been into that and been very interested in that. Um, if you can just tell from my gear, I have lots mm -hmm. of gear. I'm very portable and really enjoy uh, uh, doing this. And, and I just took to it really quickly. Okay. So this is about how much new? Um, brand new. It's it's runs about twelve hundred thirteen. How much did you pay for it used? Um, I paid about 400 bucks for it because there was a gentleman that needed to, needed to sell it. So Okay. This is this whole kit here. Well, you know, this is one of these things that is kind of hodgepodge. I'm sure some of you guys do this. You find things. We, we have what's called ham fests, which are like swap fests. They're kind of used uh, type deals. And, and so I can't really, you know, if I was to go out and buy everything brand new, I'd probably say, you know, probably five $600. I don't have that invested in it at all. Okay, um, that one over here. This one here runs about six hundred dollars. This is like that. It does the VHF, which we talked about, UHF, and then the high frequency, um, which I explained a few minutes ago. But it's only five watts, so it's a very low doesn't output. Doesn't go very far. It doesn't go very far for voice, but then you can hook a, a very small module to it and use digital, and, and basically do instant messaging. We're, we're really the first social network really that's all the social media facebook i am you can we do the same thing and have for a long time this one is digital it's digital which it, means what goes farther no um what it what it actually is 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 it, it's digital meaning it's zeros and ones right so when you key it up if someone's listening on a scanner they're just going to hear that modem type screeching sound uh it's intelligible it goes it's then decoded and then becomes what it is. The nice thing is, is uh, it has a, a great purpose. Some people don't think it does, but it really does because you can send voice and data. And data is really important because it's so much easier to send somebody a message than them having to sit there and write it down. 
So you can talk and send data at the same time, and it, it really has a, a huge place, especially in, in emergency Okay, real quick, let me, uh, this is a solar panel. Yes, sir. It'll, it w it'll power all of it? Um, it well, basically, what I use it for is, uh, is portable work, and it just keeps that battery charged up. And this battery over here? Yes, it's down which there. Which I'm not even going to try to Yeah, lift. you can lift it up. No, no, I'm just, no. Yeah. I've learned that lesson. And this... I, I, you know, I like to stay with the old, you know, the old Morse code. We call it CW continuous wave. Uh, that used to be required. It's not, but it's it's still a, a uh, extremely um, popular and used te um, form or mode is what I like to call it. Like digital is a mode. This is a digital mode. There's still hundreds, if not thousands, of operators that you can turn to HF frequency and still hear them. Unbelievable. Okay. Morse code. All right. Um, Walt, we can come back and uh, let me ask you, do you have ham radio? I don't, but it's one of the things that I really am looking forward to getting involved with. Do you have a ham radio? I, uh, I have a ham radio, but I am not a ham, so I am not permitted to transmit yet because I haven't taken my exam. Uh, but I know how the equipment works, and I'm able to listen and monitor what's going on. And that's something people should understand. There's quite inexpensive radios on the ham frequencies where they can listen and monitor what's going on in this communications network. So, like a lot of people listen to your show, but they're not and getting a cell phone signal in a right. storm or other disaster can be challenging. We've probably experienced that here. But what you may not know is that many emergency crews rely on amateur radio operators to try and help fill the gap. Whitney Wild has the scoop now on how ham radio works. In an emergency, this almost indecipherable string of messages uh, Kilo Charlie Six again. could be a lifeline. Everybody thinks that amateur radio is grandpa's radio. And what we're trying to prove is that ham radio is still very relevant even in today's world in technology. Tom Fournier is a member of Woodbridge Wireless Inc., an amateur radio club. The group helps local emergency rescue teams use radio to communicate when cell phones and call centers fail. Literally at almost any time when there's a disaster, you're going to find the amateur radio operators busy. In tents and trailers, radio enthusiasts are hoping to transmit the most messages in a 24-hour period. It's a competition as well as a benchmark mark for communication possibilities when disaster strikes. Lloyd Davis is a Morse code master. He's had the hobby since the 50s. When you start as a kid, you know, it's something that you carry on through all your life. It's a lifetime hobby, so it never loses its thrill. Now amateur radio is moving into the 21st century. Today, experts are also using digital technology. They can even send an email over radio waves. We can send messages to anywhere in the world and we can get messages back. For some, amateur radio is a way to pass the time, a way to feel and be connected. It's kind of a, a small niche that you can belong to and feel proud about. When typical technology fails and radio is the only option, it's also a way to save a life. I can help someone else that needs help when possibly no one else can. And that gives me a good feeling about who I am and why I am. That's how we end up, you know, becoming better is serving each other. A powerful message received. In Prince William County, Whitney Wild, ABC Your 7 local News. local news starts now. Good evening, I'm Bill Mitchell. Thanks for being with us for News 12 Weekend. Well, in the days following the September 11th attacks and in the weeks following the tsunami last December, most communications were knocked out. The only way of exchanging information in some cases was with amateur radio operators. Ham radio has been around almost as long as the radio itself, and now it's assuming a role in homeland defense. As News 12's Lewis Lee shows us, another generation is taking up the task. It's tonight's top local story. This scene is being played out across America this weekend. Garages and outbuildings with radios tuning, searching for others doing the same. The National Field Day event is a demonstration of how hams can set up a communications relay station in a matter of minutes in an emergency. Uh, we're old technology, but the old technology working off a battery or off a generator and still being able to communicate is what ham radio is really all about. With a simple radio and a wire antenna strung between two trees, these operators are able to speak around the globe without using satellite. You can talk literally around the world. I've talked to Australia, New Zealand, uh, the Antarctic. Impressive, but not the stuff of 21st century lore. So another goal for Field Day is to pass the love of amateur radio down to the younger generation. 
Nine-year-old Connor got the bug from his grandfather. One day he just asked me if I wanted to try and be a ham, a ham radio guy, and I said, sure. So this is where I am today. While today's radio sets are modern with digital this and computerized that, can they hold the attention of today's video gamers? Anybody can get on the computer and do that, but it, it, it takes a little bit of know-how and a little bit of skill and a little bit of luck to make contacts using just a radio and an antenna. The 17-year-old Culifer is interested in Morse code, the first use of radio. The challenge of making contacts with different people all over the place, may, even if it's around, it, around Atlanta, which is where I live, or even around the world. And the fascination with talking great distances doesn't even stop at the atmosphere. Uh, thousands of people during this uh, exercise have spoken to the International Space Station, and hopefully we'll be one of them here shortly. It may be quite a wait. It's estimated there are more than 600,000 operators participating in this weekend's field exercise. In Chickamauga, Georgia, Lewis Lee, News 12. Anyone interested in knowing more about amateur radio should contact the local ham radio clubs. They're listed in the phone book. The weekend exercise wrapped up a week-long turn knobs, get on the air, and help in disasters ham awareness celebration. Welcome back. So far in this show, we've seen some pretty advanced technology that could take off in the future. But in many parts of the world, it's the small things that make a difference. When the tsunami struck South Asia in December, it quickly became apparent that the region was ill-equipped to deal with a disaster of this scale. But basic technologies in small pockets of the ravaged areas suddenly became lifesavers. This was the day the earth shook and a series of cascading waves unleashed a fury that had never been seen before. Among the territories closest to the epicenter of that great earthquake were the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, an Indian outpost thousands of kilometers from the mainland. And by sheer coincidence, even as the waves of water crashed onto land, the airwaves were filled with the sound of amateur radio operators or hams transmitting distress calls and passing on critical information from the disaster zone. A uh, very rough copy right now. I'll try you later. I'll try later when the conditions change. HS0 These are the actual audio recordings of the radio operators at work. The hams had got to the Andamans three weeks earlier on a travel mission, a de-expedition in amateur radio lingo. The head of the expedition, Bharati Prasad, the New Delhi homemaker, has some two decades experience in ham radio. The earthquake and the tsunamis had downed mobile phone towers. Many established communication links were destroyed. But the hams were able to work thanks to their portable antennas and battery-operated radios. And this was not the first time they helped in an emergency. It's exactly what they prepare for at the National Institute of Amateur Radio, where an entire radio setup can be packed into a suitcase. First 24 hours, 36 hours or 48 hours is the critical period where you can save lots of people. And that's the time when you need image, uh, 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 communication. Rescue officials across the world acknowledge that hams are critical in helping save lives, reunite families, and coordinate numerous rescue missions. But the help in the Andamans might well have not been there. For 17 years, no amateur had operated from the islands. India has long kept visitors out of many parts of the territory, citing its strategic importance and its sensitive ecology and tribal makeup. In early December, after much bureaucratic resistance, the Indian government had green-lighted the radio mission. Even before the tsunami struck, the de-expedition's transmissions, under the radio call signs VU4NRO and VU4RBI, were closely monitored across the globe. For amateurs at the receiving end, the attraction of a de-expedition is in being able to catch signals from each of the 335 radio territories in the world. The VU4 prefix had not been used in nearly two decades. 
listening in and calling back with thousands upon thousands of hams who wrote in with cards like these to confirm that they had indeed received the transmissions. In turn, volunteers are now working overtime to acknowledge those reports. For hams like Bharati Prasad, the opportunity to help people in distress is a major plus in what is a very social hobby. At the other end could be anybody, a head of state, a journalist, or just a passionate hobbyist. I like to talk, first of all, and I would love to talk to the people. I want to make more friends. For meeting people in one day, it is not possible. So if I become a radio ham, then I can talk to the people from various parts of the world. In another part of India, a friendship across the seas kept alive by amateur radio. This is the former Portuguese territory of Goa, where Roman Catholic churches dot the countryside. It's the home of Didia de Mello, call sign VU2DM. Years ago, de Mello made friends via radio with Luis Catulo, CT1, CTZ, a fourth generation colonial settler, now a resident of Portugal. Over the years, the men have grown in their technical knowledge, exchanging notes along the way. We radio amateurs like, we like to develop new things, like for example, uh, making new antennas, uh, uh, making new sets, and then the friendship is that we help each other. Because this is not a commercial organization, it's uh, purely on friendship. The technology invented by Marconi may be more than a century old, but amateur radio has always been at the forefront of innovation. Ashur Farhan is a computer scientist developing cutting-edge telecommunication software. In his spare time, he builds inexpensive ham radios that cost a few dollars apiece. Amateur radio, he says, has taught him much of what he knows about his profession. The unwritten code of being a radio amateur is that experimenting is good and you know failure is something that you know you face you face all the time so um, even some of the best radio professionals are also radio amateurs and the professional world is also adapting the tricks of the amateur such as transmitting photographs with radio waves or sending digital information wireless signals are very very clear very very clear and with the advent of the internet have come new opportunities Bharati Prasad says the web has extended the range of transmissions so and expanded the community of users. Thanks a lot and see you again. 73s and Namaste from India via 2 RBI Iowa. All the members of the Prasad family are licensed amateur radio operators. This is VU3 DBS. Over. Over. Bharati Prasad says she'd like to train and license more operators in the remotest corners of India preparing them for any future disaster. The woman who got the nickname Angel of the Seas for her tireless work during the tsunami says with the right training, anyone could have done what she did. Ram Ram Gopal for Global Challenges, New Delhi. The timing of this year's hamvention is pretty ironic since a tornado ripped through the town of Cedarville just two days ago. Wally Aliu shows us why ham radio operators are crucial during times of severe weather. 25,000 people from all 50 states. Dayton Hamvention is kind of considered the mecca of ham radio, <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it was on our bucket list. And about 42 countries. When all else fails, radio materials are there. We can use uh, solar power, we can use wind power, you can use the battery of your car. When tornadoes touch down, like the one we saw in Cedarville on Wednesday, the National Weather Service is depending on the ham sky warrant spotters to radio in any weather updates they see around them. We were very busy Wednesday night. Well-trained amateur operators were monitoring the storm and feeding us the information that we needed. This is the first time that we've had a tornado so close to ham venture. And I think it just reminded everybody that hams play a can play a vital part in keeping the public informed about what's going on with the weather. These licensed amateur radio operators from Arkansas just dealt with their own EF4 tornado three weeks ago. We have friends who were chasing the tornado as it was happening and then provided communications for the relief efforts immediately afterwards. So while hamvention may be a lot of fun, it's also very necessary. I'm a weather junkie, I'm a radio junkie. I, I like the rush. 
Um, I also like helping people. Amateur radio has the capability to communicate when, when other options really may not be available. You to be able to continue to communicate in those situations can be tremendously powerful. Ultimately, can save lives. In Trotwood, while they have you information, Fox health and welfare, be the eyes and the ears for the police departments. Johnson, or N7DND to his friends, was at home in Bountiful when he got the call from the Davis County Sheriff yesterday morning. Communications were breaking down because of all the commotion, and the sheriff was wondering if some ham radio operators could help get messages through to emergency personnel. Within no time, Johnson had 18 volunteers who were staffed at cities throughout Davis County. To have uh, those ham radio operators on call and even in our uh, radio room was a tremendous asset for us. The radio system was saturated. We were at the a maximum. The lines were so maxed out, sometimes yeah, dispatchers you. couldn't respond to police right away. It is very scary for the dispatchers to push the button and not be able to talk for three minutes. Which is why ham radio operators were called in to keep communications going. For Johnson, it was an all-day job, but one that kept them smiling every single minute of it. He knew his team made a difference. We train for days, we live for days like this. This is some of the most excitement that we can have. And ham radio operators in the area train every single Imagine week. Imagine this scenario jump. after a hurricane hits South Florida. The internet is down, cell towers aren't working. You can't even make a call on a landline. How would you communicate in an emergency? How would you get help? We may all be relying on technology that's 100 years old on the radio. Uh, WX4NHC National Hurricane Center in Miami for night control. They're called amateur radio operators, HAMS for short, and they fill a special role here at the National Hurricane Center. They communicate in ways others can't. We have a group of about 30 volunteers, and they come in here during hurricanes that are anywhere in the Atlantic. The National Hurricane Center relies on data and weather observations for their forecasts and reports. But sometimes the weather data can't be transmitted, either because there's no internet or sometimes because the weather is just too bad. Many times we basically fill in the gaps from all the other weather data that they get through satellite and air reconnaissance and all that. And there's some gaps on the surface that they may not have. So we fill in those re reports. We basically take uh, surface reports from other hams that have weather stations and then relay them here to the hurricane forecasters. Sometimes they not only report the weather, but become part of the action. It happened during Hurricane Katrina, which is not that long ago. Other times, hams are the life-saving backbone in a natural disaster. We have in our group uh, doctors, architects, engineers. They all bring their own set of skills as well as their communication skill. We get paid nothing because we're volunteers, but we get paid in the satisfaction that what we do, we feel is important and we feel that it actually does help lives in, in the long run. And Julio has one important bit of advice for all of us. Have a communications plan with your family. Where are you going to be? If you lose cell phone communications, where are you going to meet? You know, because sometimes you can't talk to each other. So if the power goes out and the internet goes down, we may all be relying on technology that's 100 years old to get help to where it's needed. Are there any other stations on frequency that can copy the Hurricane Center over? Uh, QSL Net Control, this is Whiskey X-Ray 4, National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. <laughs> Name is Julio. It may sound like John Pritchett is searching for extraterrestrial life. But he is really down to earth. Pritchett is a ham, a commonly used term for an amateur radio operator. He is tuning his radio to talk to people around the globe from his ham shack in California. This is W6JWK, John in Fresno. Pritchett is part of a growing trend that has been around for a hundred years. According to the Federal Communications Commission, ham radio licenses are at an all-time high with over 700,000 licenses in the U.S. It's great. It's a wonderful hobby. Here is an HF transceiver. With one of these radios, we can easily communicate around the world. Manager Luke Ron of Amateur Electronics Supply in Las Vegas says his ham radio business is going steady. I think there's something magical about being able to communicate with people around the world using nothing other than a radio, wireless communications. You don't have to rely on cell phones. While most hams talk to people in far off places, if you really want to ham it up with some friends, you need to do a fox hunt. This is the radio equivalent to ham to ham combat. 
Local amateur radio clubs compete to find a hidden transmitter, or what they like to call a box, using their handmade antennas. They attach a receiver that allows them to search for radio signals that come from the fox. Uh, the fox hunting is really fun. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. The thrill of the chase, the competition being the first to find the transmitter. All you need is a couple hundred bucks to get started and an FCC license to join the craze. In Fresno, California, Michelle Macaluso, FoxNews.com. A laptop, Wi-Fi, and outlets. Modern conveniences many of us take for granted until we don't have them. And I have completely outfitted, designed and outfitted to make as a portable radio station. The portable radio station means that I'm completely self-sufficient. Skip Ferguson is talking about the 7x7x12 seven by seven by cargo trailer turned portable emergency radio station he custom built. This station is capable of transmitting on every radio frequency that can be used to transmit, period. The former military man learned how to operate the ham radio when he was a teenager, something Skip taught me a little of today. Is this frequency in use? Is this frequency in use? CQ, 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 K5AWC. Skip constructed many stations like this one for the Navy, but wanted to build his own. Providing a service that is desperately needed in an emergency environment. A service he wants to teach others, including his grandsons. We interface with every emergency system there is uh, at the county level, at the state level. So there's a whole lot of interconnection already. So they too could help in a time of need. Jenny Walsh, KAGS closely with the National Weather Service to make sure you and your family stay safe during severe weather. There's also another team working with the Weather Service whose main concern is your safety, Skywarn. John Van Pelt grew up in Raleigh and has been watching our skies for more than 30 years. Our group is Central Carolina Skywarn. We uh, handle almost a quarter of the state. And we're the volunteer spotter group for the National Weather Service. Using ham radio, these trained Skywarn spotters tell the Weather Service what is or isn't on the ground. We take the hail reports, the flooding reports. If we see wind damage being done, we report that. Uh, large limbs coming down, live trees coming down, and of course any rotation in the clouds or funnel clouds or tornadoes on the ground. In the heart of Carolina, the trees and hilly terrain make it difficult to see approaching storms. And the curvy roads make it even tougher to get away. That's why we don't chase in this area. A lot of us try to find good vantage points where we can see 360 all around us. John knows how to play it safe, and that's exactly what he wants everyone else to do. Stay safe. Stay inside. Uh, we get a lot of training from the National Weather Service, so we get advanced spotter training that shows us tornado genesis and what to expect and what to look for in the clouds to get ready for a possibility of a tornado. Uh, most people have watched Twister, and they've watched uh, The Perfect Storm, and they see the TV versions of how this stuff works, and it's not like that at all. John's spotter vehicle is rigged with the latest gear to keep him ahead of the storm. We can monitor the satellite imagery. We can see the radar imagery, and the, uh, the radar imagery will update every five or six minutes when we're in a severe situation, so we can actually see what's happening around us to either go to where we want to observe something or to stay away from something that's dangerous. The mobile weather station monitors the conditions outside. The scrolling text on the rooftop displays warnings and safety information. The Internet camera streams live pictures, and the NOAA weather radio this program originates from the national brings him updated watches and warnings. But even with the latest technology, not all tornadoes can be foreseen. The tornado in 88 was bad too because it was uh, a twilight zone situation. It was November, it was the middle of the night, you don't expect that to happen and the next day you wake up and look at this uh, area where you live and you see landmarks are gone and it's, you don't even really know where you are. You can see here just how destructive that twister was as it ripped through North Raleigh. A devastating F4 on the Fujita scale, packing winds of 207 to 260 miles an hour, leaving four dead and 156 injured. John hopes he'll be there to warn people the next time a tornado touches down.
Skywarn volunteers like John are an integral part of putting the pieces of the severe weather puzzle together. And you can be sure that they, along with the National Weather Service and the ABC 11 AccuWeather Storm Center team, are all working together to get you the most reliable and up-to-date severe weather information. We are not storm chasers. We are the eyes of the National Weather Service, and uh, we don't go out looking for trouble. No, but when trouble comes to them, they report it to keep all of us safe. I'm Jack Atherton. And hello, I'm Deborah Lins. They are the Miami Valley weather spotters who report directly to the National Weather Service. And with the severe weather season upon us, no doubt they could be very busy. Dayton Skywarm is uh, made up of about two dozen people dedicating their time. Jackie Kutcher spent time with them today. She's going to tell us all about it. Yeah, Dayton Skywarm, they're made up of about 16 members and they certainly work hard. They literally dedicate their time to watching the skies when severe weather strikes. And apparently with some training, all of us could do it. This is W8OK Dayton Skywarn checking in. I repeat, this is a test. This is Dayton Skywarn headquarters, a group of volunteer ham radio operators who help spot severe weather around the Miami Valley. We're the eyes for the National Weather Service. A lot of times the radars don't always pick up um, everything. We can tell you frankly that yes, there is one on the ground and we see a debris cloud. And uh, this is the kind of information that technology uh, for all of its, its wonderful things it can do, it doesn't give you an eyewitness report on what's actually happening at the scene. Mike Carter, who's been spotting for more than 30 years, oh, says so don't well. confuse storm spotters with storm chasers. We don't go out looking for trouble, but if we do see trouble, we want to make sure that the National Weather Service can report that out to the public. Beyond severe weather. If the cell phones go down, if the land lines go down, if the internet goes down. Amateur radio operators can still communicate, so they're constantly our safety net in any sort of large-scale emergency. While the tornado siren sounded for the statewide test. W8OK, W8BSI. The spotters from 17 surrounding counties checked in. You make sure everybody's radios work, that our equipment works. So basically, it's, it's a test before severe weather kicks in. Weather, the Skywarn team hopes to protect all of us from. That's why they do it. Give back to the community, help make people safe. If you want to be a spotter, you can attend free training this Saturday, March 8th. It's happening at Miami Valley Hospital and the Beiser Auditorium and the Berry Women's Center. It's happening from 9 till noon. An advanced class, if you've done it before, is going on from 1 till 4.30. You'll hear from meteorologists with the National Weather Service and other weather spotters. And this hobby, by the way, is inexpensive, if you're wondering. Some handheld radios go for as little as $40. We're having a field day across the country and here in Louisville. Whiskey for Charlie November. Whiskey for Charlie November. Hams are the folks who operate ham radios, and this weekend they've been fine tuning their communication skills. Some gathered on the grounds of the St. Joseph Children's Home in the Crescent Hill neighborhood. The every uh, emergency response agency incorporates ham radio into part of its emergency response plan uh, because it needs to, number one, and number two is because by law it's required to. Robert Klein says the hams come in handy during the ice storm that hit Kentucky, especially in the western part of the state where cell towers went down. It is estimated there are three to 4,000 licensed ham radio operators in the Commonwealth. Craig Fugate has a long resume. Because his time is short, I'm not going to read his, his resume, but uh, we are very privileged to have him here, here with us today. And, and let me say this, he oversees 3,700 uh, employees, another 4,000 that look after us, prepare for disaster, respond to disaster. So it's a, with uh, a great deal of pleasure that I get to introduce to you today, Mr. Craig Fugate, Administrator of, of uh, FEMA. Thank you, sir, for being here. I want to hit four broad areas because I think, you know, we talk about communications and we talk about the public. Oftentimes, I, I almost get a sense we pit one against the other in how we describe things. You know, I think we talk a lot about social media at the expense of the broadcasters. I think we talk a lot about public safety communications, but then we come back to broadband. And then there's one group that we never talk about, but they're the ultimate backups, and they were the originators of what we call social media, and that's the amateur radio operators. The initial communications out of Haiti, some of the communications at various parts, and we go back and forth across these disasters. 
is volunteers using assigned frequencies that they're allocated, their own equipment, their own money, nobody pays them. We're the first ones oftentimes getting word out in the critical first hours and first days as the rest of the systems came back up. And I think that there's a tendency that because we have done so much to build infrastructure and resiliency in all of our other systems, we have tended to dismiss that role when everything else fails. Amateur radio oftentimes is our last line of defense. And I think at times we get so sophisticated and we have gotten so used to the reliability and resilience in our wireless and wired and our broadcast industry and all of our public safety communications that we can never phantom that they'll fail. They do, they have, they will. And I think a strong amateur radio community that's plugged into these plans, you know, most of the time they're going to be bored because there's not a lot they're going to be doing that people aren't doing with Twitter and Facebook and everything else. But when you need amateur radio, you really need them. So four broad areas, all equally important, all key to one mission, and that is meeting the needs of survivors and helping them deal with the challenges that they face.